Hi there. Uh, so my name is Matt. Um, as Jim said, I work for Olympus at headquarters. I am our technical product manager. Um, I've been with Olympus for almost five years. Um, prior to that, I was with a fashion photography studio here in New York for 13 years. So this is, photography is in my blood. It's uh, what I've always done. Um, and I, I feel like I kind of have the dream job here, uh, getting to come to work and play with cameras every day. Um, so how many of you are familiar with Olympus cameras, in particular OMD system? Frank, that's good. <laughs> good to hear. Um, so um, a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about here, you might already be familiar with some of the concepts and some of our uh, technologies. And the rest of you, I'll try to do my best to explain. Um, so we're gonna, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to um, talk about a brief history of Olympus. Um, we've been around for 100 years, so this is going to be a very, very small portion of it. Um, product overview um, of the new camera, and then time for Q&A. So as far as Olympus goes, we were founded in 1919 um, as a manufacturer of microscopes. It was the first product we made. Um, we turned 100 on October 12th, so we just turned 100. So it's a, it's a big deal around, around the company. We're all excited um, that we were able to, um, able to help celebrate that. Um, the first camera that we produced uh, was in 1936. It was the Olympus Semi. Um, and that was in, uh, that was 80 years ago, a little over 80 years ago. Um, the OM-1, that's kind of the foundation for a lot of what we do now, uh, was produced in 1972 um, by the gentleman you see here on the, on the right, um, uh, Yoshihisa Maitani. He was our head engineer. Um, he was tasked with building a camera that was different than uh, any cameras that anyone had seen before. And he was going for something that was very, very small uh, very light, something that fit very comfortably in every photographer's hands. Um, they went back to the drawing board no less than four times, completely scrapped all of their plans and started over because every time he was presented with a new prototype, he was not happy and it wasn't, it wasn't different enough and didn't really provide the benefit that he was looking for until he arrived at the OM-1. Um, does anyone know what OM stands for? It stands for Olympus Maitani. He named the camera uh, essentially after himself, and that nomenclature um, still stands today. Um, so again, the design philosophy of the original OM is something that we've carried through to today's cameras. So anyone that looks at our cameras say they're beautiful and they look that they look like an older camera. Um, that's because we've it's very intentional. So here is a picture of the OM-1 from 1972, and this is a camera that we introduced last week. Um, so. We've managed to carry that design language through to all of our products today. Um, anyone that knows Olympus knows that we rely pretty heavily on a couple of technologies um, that integrate really well together and make all of our products what they are. Um, we have high resolution lenses. We're an optics company first and foremost. Um, we focus very, very heavily on lens design and making all of our lenses as perfect as we can. Um, compact and lightweight is another um, core competency of Olympus. Uh, we focus on that very heavily. We always work to make all of our products as light and as small as, as we can, uh, knowing that the best camera is always the one you have with you, and it's something I'm sure you hear over and over again in this business. Um, and we know that to be true, so we, we, um, we work to make our cameras as small as possible. And then five-axis image stabilization. Um, that is something that we do like no other company. Uh, there is no other company that can achieve what we have with image stabilization. Um, and the way ours works is it's suspended in a, a, a magnetic field with what we call voice coil motors, and the sensor shifts in the opposite direction uh, of your hand motion. So anytime your, your hand moves, that sensor essentially stays stationary. And you can move the camera quite a bit uh, without any motion blur. Um, here is um, a look at all of our products from 2015 up till today. Um, so we have three series of, OM, of OMDs. We have the EM1, which is our flagship series. We have the EM5, um, our, middle, um, our middle tier camera, and the EM10. Um, up until now, uh, we've been updating the products pretty regularly, but you notice that there's a, a pretty big gap here on the EM5. Um, anybody that bought an EM5 in 2015 has been very patiently waiting uh, for us to introduce a new uh, successor model. So um, we've done that here. Uh, we have the EM5 Mark III, and that slots in very nicely between the EM1 Mark II and 1X and the EM10 line. In fact, it actually gets a little bit of a bump up, and it's inheriting a bunch of technologies from the EM1 Mark II, and that's what makes this camera so special. 
So now I'm going to take you through the EM5 Mark III in some detail. So there's six topics we're going to discuss. Compact and lightweight weather sealed system, outstanding image quality, which goes without saying, um, high speed autofocus performance, um, compact image stabilization unit, which is actually the unit that houses the sensor and, and, and controls um, the image stabilization system, um, OMD movie, and Olympus specific shooting features like live composite um, and focus stacking, things of that nature. So compact and lightweight. As I said, we focus very, very heavily on um, size and weight, uh, making sure that all of our cameras are something that you want to take with you. Um, not just because of their great image quality, just but because they're easy to carry with you all the time. Um, so the M5 Mark III gets a little bit smaller and lighter than its predecessor. Um, that's due to a couple of a couple of things. Um, we've changed the battery. Um, at first glance, we looked at the battery, which is the same battery that's found in the EM10 Mark III, Mark III and the Pen Light series. So it's a little smaller um, and lighter, but it's a newer battery technology. So we are getting the same battery life out of it that we did from the EM5 Mark II. So again, without any reduction in performance, um, we're able to save a little bit of weight and size. Um, that made room for a little bit more, uh, some more electronic components inside the camera body um, and enabled us to increase performance in other areas. We also have a new image stabilization unit that is smaller than the one we used in the past. So again, um, another method of saving, um, saving size. We know mirrorless is a tremendous, uh, tremendous buzzword right now. Every camera company has made the jump to mirrorless, um, but not all mirrorless cameras are created equal. Not all of them are as as small as they necessarily claim to be. Um, if you look at our camera, the M5 Mark III, that's pictured here with a, a 12 to 40 millimeter lens. That's the equivalent of a 24 to 80. Um, next to uh, what you'd see is a typical full frame mirrorless body. You can see the bodies are roughly the same size, but the equivalent lens is much larger. So you're really not um, saving any size uh, or weight, or not, not much size or weight, by um, choosing one of those products. Um, with Micro Four Thirds, we feel like it's the best balance of image quality and portability. And these are uh, actual um, real world comparisons. You're going to save about 64% um, uh, you're, you're at about 64% of the weight of a full frame mirrorless product and 55% of the volume. So it's about half the size if you factor in um, an equivalent system. Weatherproofing is something that um, we've kind of been at the forefront of for a while. Um, we have our tough series cameras, the little, um, the little uh, point and shoot cameras that are extremely durable, waterproof, you can take them scuba diving. We use that same technology in our, um, in our weatherproof OMD bodies. Um, all of those um, red lines you see are O-rings and seals that work to keep dust and moisture out of your camera. So this camera is IPX1 rated, so you can um, shoot out in a driving rainstorm or a blinding snowstorm, not that you'd see anything, but uh, the camera can certainly stand up to um, anything, almost almost anything you can throw at it in terms of in terms of moisture. I wouldn't submerge it, but um, you know a, a pretty good rainstorm won't won't hurt it at all. Um, it's the same technology that's found in the M1X, which is our top of the line uh, flagship camera. So, are any of you familiar with the M5 Mark II? Any, is anybody shooting with one currently, or anybody seen one? So there's a couple of changes from the M5 Mark II to the Mark III. Um, the biggest visual change is the mode dial has moved from the left side of the camera over to the right side. Um, so you have um, even more opportunities for one-handed operation. Um, the camera is small. You can actually, I'm just going to grab one over here. You can reach that mode dial pretty easily with your thumb. Um, so you don't need to use two hands to operate the camera most of the time. Um, we've also increased the grip size, made it a little bit deeper, and the thumb rest a little bit deeper. So its uh, ergonomics have been, been improved. It's a very, very comfortable camera to hold. So image quality. When we talk about image quality at Olympus, we're always talking about um, the combination of all of the components that make great image quality. So it starts with the lens, but then we have three other components that factor into that. 
Um, one is the sensor. Um, we're using an outstanding 20 megapixel sensor that offers on-chip phase detection autofocus, which is something we didn't do in the previous generation. Um, the new image stabilization unit that I talked about, that's smaller and lighter and um, improved performance from the previous one. And a new image processor, the TruePic 8, which comes from the EM1 Mark II. So it's very, very fast, um, very, very powerful, and can control all of the different um, unique features in this camera. Um, noise due to the new processor is reduced quite a bit. If you look at these um, little um, these little sections of the larger image, you can see there's very, very little noise in the shadows. There's, a, a, it's actually not uh, perceptible. Um, that's due to the new, the new image processor and the new imaging algorithms that are there. One of the biggest, one of the biggest improvements to the EM5 Mark III from the from the EM5 Mark II is the autofocus system. Um, we know that one of the pieces of feedback that we did get on the EM5 Mark II is that although the focusing system was very, very accurate, um, it had a little bit of trouble at times with moving subjects, particularly subjects moving towards you or away from you. Um, the only type of focusing system that can really lock onto a subject like that is phase detection. The M1 Mark II had it, but the M5 did not. Now the M5 Mark III gets phase detection from the EM1. Um, so it has 121 point all cross type phase detection. Um, when I say all cross type, I mean that the sensors, instead of being a horizontal or a vertical sensor that will only read or pick up um, lines that move perpendicular to the sensor, um, it has the opportunity to um, see both of those. So it has um, a lot more to lock onto, essentially. And that grid is a pretty good depiction of what our focusing system looks like. It covers, I believe, 78% of the frame. Um, so you're pretty much, you can blanket your entire subject with autofocus, um, with autofocus points. The way our autofocus system works, and it's a huge, a big benefit to mirrorless, is that as it's taking pictures, um, it's going to read the focus data from the previous frame and use that to help calculate where the subject is moving next, like the skateboarder. So it'll, the camera will take a picture and it will actually, in addition to looking at the subject and where that subject is, it will look at where it focused on the previous frame. So because it can read that data and continue to focus uh, in real time while you're shooting, because there's not a mirror in the way blocking the sensor, um, the autofocus performance actually accelerates while you shoot sequentially. Um, that's something that an SLR can't do, because every time you take a frame, the mirror flips down um, in front of the autofocus, or flips up in front of the autofocus sensor, preventing the camera from focusing while you're shooting. So another really, really cool option that we have is what we call um, the, tu the um, touch AF shutter and autofocus trackpad. So you can, when you're looking through the viewfinder with your eye, you can touch your thumb to the rear monitor and actually move your thumb across that monitor and that'll move the autofocus point and you'll see it move in the viewfinder. So that way you don't need to take your eye off of your subject while you're, while you're um, moving your autofocus point. Um, the, other, the other option you have is you can use touch AF shutter. If you're foot composing with, your rear, with the rear monitor, you can just tap on the monitor on the portion of the frame where you want to focus, and the camera will focus and shoot. So you can actually shoot just the way you do with a smartphone if, you're, if you prefer that. We also have face and eye priority autofocus, so you can turn on eye face detection. The camera will actually sense faces up to eight, and it'll put a box around it so that you know that, that it's locked on. And then you can get a little bit more granular and you can choose um, eye detection AF. The camera will put a box around um, either the right or left eye, or you can actually uh, make that even a little more granular and you can choose right or left eye and the camera, will, um, the camera will search for either the right eye or the left eye, depending on what you've chosen. Um, as far as autofocus options, we have a few more as far as your target modes. Um, so the M5 Mark II had single point, um, nine point, and 81 point. And then this camera gets five point, uh, a 25 point target, and also small AF points. So you can turn all of those autofocus points on if you're gonna shoot something like birds in flight against a blue sky, like, like it's pictured there. Um, or you can choose just one point, um, but you have several different options to choose from. 
So I think someone was asking me um, about um, image stabilization. I think you were asking me about uh, how long you can handhold a picture for. Um, so this has, um, it, it's not, it's not our, it's not our, um, the best we've achieved, that would be the EM1X, but this camera can achieve five and a half shutter speed steps of compensation, uh, which is a tremendous amount. Meaning if um, you're using the 300 millimeter lens, you would need somewhere near um, a 600th of a second to stabilize that, to stabilize that um, image. But with our system, you can shoot down to, I believe about a 15th of a second at 300 millimeters and still get a stable shot. Um, and that's pretty impressive. When we were learning about um, one, of our, one of our new cameras in Japan, a bunch of us went outside at night and we were having a contest to see who could hand hold the longest exposure. Um, I got to about four or five seconds and one of my coworkers uh, actually hand held a shot for 20 seconds. Um, and that's something that would not be achievable without an image stabilization system like this. Um, he did have a little bit of extra help because he was using our 300 millimeter lens, which has, also has image stabilization in it and uses a system called Sync IS. So it will synchronize the image stabilization between the lens and what's in the body, and it will give you an extra stop of image stabilization. So here's an illustration of Sync IS. The two lenses that have it are a 12 to 100 f4 and our 300 millimeter f4. Um, and um, that will compensate for all types of movement, roll, pitch, yaw, um, up and down, left and right. Um, and then the, again, the image stabilization in the lens will give you an extra stop, essentially. Does everyone understand the way image stabilization works? Or, you know, what, what, when I talk about how many stops of compensation? Any questions so far? So it's the one that I'm familiar with was having the image stabilization in the lens, not in the body. Right. So, so SLRs, yeah. in particular, because they can't shift the sensor because there's too, it's basically too many moving parts. You already move, have a mirror box that has to move the mirror out of the way. Um, the sensor really has nowhere to go. So in-body image stabilization actually shifts the sensor itself. So um, the actual sensor unit right here, that when I energize that by turning the camera on, that's actually floating in um, basically four magnets. Um, for lack of a, of a better explanation, I think. Um, so when I move, that sensor will shift in the opposite direction to keep it stationary. So the body is essentially moving around the sensor while the sensor stays fixed. So that, because of that, it can compensate and it can tilt and you know up and down and left to right. So any type of movement. So it can do roll, pitch, yaw, and then up and down and side to side. So lenses just by the nature of the way lens IS works, can only compensate for pitch and yaw. So just like that or like this. So, but the combination of the two is what really makes it special because they're, they're perfectly synchronized and it, it, it improves your um, compensation by a stop. So it'll let you essentially shoot one whole shutter speed step slower than you would have been able to otherwise. Um, but being able to add all five axes or add three additional axes than what you have in just the lens um, is, makes a tremendous difference. So we've added, um, we have a new viewfinder in the EM5 Mark III. Um, the previous model had an LCD viewfinder panel. Um, and LCDs are great. Um, they, they have a great refresh rate. Um, they have a pretty good bit of dynamic range. Um, we've switched to um, OLED, organic LED. Um, now the refresh rate is where we want it. It will give you 60 frame per second or 60 hertz refresh rate. Um, but also the colors are a lot more vivid and you do have more dynamic range. This is the best viewfinder that I've used um, in any one of our products. Um, it is a little bit, it's the same resolution, 2.36 million dots, but we did decrease the magnification just a little bit. Um, it's now 1.37x. Um, the reason we did that is a lot of people wear glasses, myself included. Um, I couldn't, with our larger magnification viewfinder, I couldn't see all four corners of the viewfinder when I had my glasses on. So then I was in a situation where I would have to always flip my glasses up to take a picture and I have to make sure my, my diopter was adjusted the way I wanted it. Um, but that was the only way I could see it. But with this camera, I can see all four corners of the viewfinder while I'm wearing my glasses. Um, and that actually made it a lot more usable for me.
So 4K video. Um, 4K was, was a feature that uh, we've been asked for a lot in this model. Uh, this camera gets it. Um, 4K, 30 or 24 frames per second. Um, we also have a cinema 4K mode, which is like DCI. It's the slightly wider cinematic format. Um, and that will, uh, that's at 24 frames per second. Uh, it also captures the most data. That will uh, capture 237 megabits per second um, of data, uh, which is a tremendous amount. Um, so if you're heavy into video, if you're gonna be color grading, if you're going to be um, making a video for any type of pro professional use, this camera can certainly help you with that. And once you combine that with the image stabilization, the fact that you can shoot 4K video handheld, you don't, if you, the, if you notice the picture here, um, the videographer doesn't have a steady cam or any type of stabilization rig or a gimbal, and that's because the image stabilization is so good. And we get comments all the time about videographers that uh, picked up our camera and are just shooting run and gun video, but they don't need a gimbal, and that's what's so amazing. Um, how many of you experience problems with dust on your sensor? You go out and you shoot all day and you come back and you look at your images and all of a sudden in a, in a, you know, a pretty neutral sky, uh, you see the big gray dust spot. And now you're like, oh, now I have to spend all this time spotting my pictures and taking that one dust spot out. I used to do it all the time when I worked for a photography studio. Um, since I've come to Olympus in five years, I've never had to clean a sensor on any of, any of the bodies that I use. Um, and I, you know, it, admittedly don't treat my cameras as well as I could. I leave body caps off all the time. I still don't have, and I wouldn't advise that you do that, but I still haven't had to clean a sensor, and I think Frank could probably attest to this. I mean, I just don't have to clean my sensor. Um, we have something called supersonic wave filter that we introduced on our e-system, which was our SLR, and what that does is it vibrates the sensor at 30,000 times per second and basically shakes the dust off of it. Um, so you can see that the little dust particles being blown off the sensor. Um, it really does help. I have photographers that I work with in our educators program that have told me, um, you know, when I put a lens on a body and I go on a trip, I, I need more bodies because I don't change lenses because I'm afraid of dust. And this was someone that came from another brand. And I said, well, how long have you done that for? And he said, like, and he said, like six or seven years. And I said, well, I think you should just change lenses. And he went on a trip and he actually changed lenses and had no problem. So he, it really um, is a pretty special technology and it's one of the things that we do better than anybody else. Um, has anyone heard us talk about Pro Capture, uh, the feature we call Pro Capture? You want to talk about it? <laughs> Jim likes Pro Capture, it's his favorite feature. That's uh, one of my two favorite features. Pro Capture, for lack of a better word, really means pre capture. The whole idea of the camera is you press the button down halfway, set the camera for whatever shutter sync. Uh, sequence you'd like, up to 14 pictures, I think. Press a button down and the camera will start shooting. One, 14 pictures. Once it gets to the 14th picture, it erases number one, goes to 15, erases number two. At all the time, whenever you're doing this, as long as you push that button down halfway, the camera's going to have 14 pictures in the buffer. Now imagine, now you're looking at yourself, well, what's he talking about? Okay, the biggest thing to do is bird watching, kid kicking a soccer ball, somebody hitting a baseball. When is that perfect moment when that foot hits the ball? You press that button down, hold it halfway, the camera's always taking that series of photographs, always erasing and always taking new photographs. When you press the button down the rest of the way, it holds those in the buffer and puts them in the memory. So no matter when you think you've got that perfect shot, the camera already has 14 pictures before you within that one second, one and a half second time period. That's pro-capture or pre-capture? Yeah, so our, 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 one of our visionaries, Scott Bourne, who's a bird photographer, um, he calls it his time machine because no matter how good your reaction time is, if you're sitting there, if you're sitting there with um, a camera pointed at a bird, you're waiting for that bird to take off. Um, so you're waiting for that, that moment the bird flinches and you press the shutter. You'll almost never catch it. No one's reaction time is that good. Mine's definitely not. But because the camera's always running that buffer and, and capturing 14 frames at a shot before you actually press the shutter, when you press the shutter, you've got that moment. You're definitely gonna have it. Choose which one to keep or they all collect? They'll all, co they'll all they'll be on the card and then you can look, find the best one because remember, you can shoot with this camera up to 30 frames per second. So that can all happen at 30 frames per second and so, in, so in just a second, you're gonna have 30 pictures. 
Um, that's a lot, to, it can be a lot to edit through, but you know, <laughs> but you can also dial that back. You can set that for 10 frames a second or six frames a second, but you know that you're gonna get the, the moment that you were looking to capture. Um, and you know, if you're just gonna rely on your reaction time alone, most of the time you're not gonna get it. But with, with Pro Capture, you'll definitely get it. So we have another feature called high res shot mode. So our sensor is 20 megapixel, but because of the image stabilization unit, it can shift the sensor in half pixel increments. It can actually just move it up, up and down and left and right. So it'll shift and take eight different pictures with the pixels overlapping just a little bit, and then it will composite those and it can make one image that's 50 megapixels. So even though the sensor's a little bit smaller, you can still get a 50 megapixel image out of it. Um, the one caveat is that it has to be a static subject, like this house, um, like artwork for reproduction or something like that. Um, but you can definitely increase the resolution from what, what it is, uh, what the sensor actually is. Uh, we have a mode called uh, uh, sub, uh, autofocus cluster display um, that will let you, if you turn this mode on, it'll light up every sensor that's currently active. Um, so if you're, so you're pretty much assured that you'll know what, um, what autofocus points, um, where your autofocus points are, um, are picking up your subject. So how many of you, do any of you shoot birds or wildlife or any type of telephoto work? No? <laughs> um, so if you're shooting a subject with a long telephoto lens, I mean, I'm sure most of you ex have experienced an autofocus lens scanning back and forth, zzz, 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 back and forth because it can't find the subject and it has to scan through that whole range to, to try and find the subject. So some lenses have an autofocus limiter like our 300 millimeter, but that's a physical switch on the lens. If you're not using that lens, um, you don't have that option. We now have an autofocus limiter in the body. Um, this was in the EM1 Mark II, but you can set that range. You can set up to three different ranges for the camera to focus within. So you can have one for longer distances, one for medium range, and one for say like 10 feet to 30 feet. So that way the camera is only going to scan that distance range for a subject. Uh, we have something called CAF tracking sensitivity. If you're shooting any type of fast action or sports, um, there are certain sports or certain types of moving subjects that move very fluidly, like um, a hockey player that might be skating across the ice. But another player might skate in between you and your subject. So if you set this, uh, the sensitivity to the minus side, like minus two, the camera's not gonna pick up that subject that comes between you and the, your intended subject. Something like the squirrel that you see here, that squirrels move very erratically, you would set that towards the more sensitive side so that the sensor can stay locked onto your subject as it runs around and changes direction. Then we have something called focus bracketing and focus stacking. So focus bracketing, does anyone do any macro work? Close subjects, you guys do? What kind of macro work do you do, Jim? Uh, flowers. This is perfect for you. Um, so anyway, what you can do is if you're shooting, doing macro work, um, when you're shooting very, very close, your depth of field becomes very, very shallow. Um, so what you would wanna do is take um, several different images at different focus points and then composite them later. Um, the camera can take up to 999 shots at different uh, focus points from front to back and then you can composite those with our software, Olympus Workspace, or something like Helix and Focus or Photoshop, and it'll give you one image with very, very uh, deep depth of field. Then we have a, we've taken that a step further. We have something called focus stacking. What focus stacking does will automatically take eight images at different focus points, and it will composite those in camera automatically. So you click the shutter once, the camera takes the eight pictures using the electronic shutter, and then it puts them together and you have one image that's sharp from front to back. So another technology that's uh, found its way into this camera is something we call anti-flicker shooting. Um, if anybody has shot pictures in a gym or any type of a venue that has say like mercury vapor light or fluorescent light that flickers on and off 60 cycles per second, occasionally if you're shooting sequentially, you're probably gonna catch a picture that's that, that was taken when the, Im when the lights were not at peak brightness. Um, so you'll wind up with a whole sequence of frames and then you'll have a couple that are, that are a little bit underexposed. So the M5 Mark III can sense 
the, the flickering of the lights and it will only allow the camera to shoot at peak brightness. So you, you will wind up not having any frames that are underexposed. And then this is kind of one of, one of our favorite technologies, something called live composite. Um, how, does anybody like to shoot star trails or um, images like this of, of um, trails of cars on a road with brake lights and headlights? Um, but what ha so what happens when you try to do a long exposure and you catch that, eventually what happens? You wind up with an overexposed, an overexposed image. The sky gets very bright because eventually it's exposing the sky and it's exposing everything else around it. Um, until eventually it, it, it gets lighter and lighter and washes out. So we have this technology that no one else has. It's an Olympus exclusive uh, feature called Live Composite. So you'll set, you, you can find this in bulb mode on this particular camera. Um, and what it will do, you'll, get, you'll set your base exposure, determine your shutter speed, whether it's one second, a half a second, um, you get the correct exposure. And then the camera will start taking pictures at that shutter speed for up to three hours. So as it's taking a picture, it'll take your one base exposure, and then it will only add from that moment on new light. So uh, an airplane flies by, it'll capture that, it'll capture that streak of light. But your sky and anything else will no longer be exposed. It won't add any light to that, so you won't wind up with that overexposure. And the best part about it is, because it's mirrorless, uh, because we have live view, is you'll see that image building on your monitor in real time. So you, it'll go for a maximum of three hours. But at 90 minutes, if you say, hey, that looks really great, you click your shutter, and it stops the exposure. And then you, you're left with um, one perfect, perfectly exposed image with all of those streaks of light. You can do it with star trails. Um, you can do it with cars. We even have um, one of our visionaries, Joe Edelman, likes to use strobe and use um, light wands to, to do pictures of people with it. it and it's something that um, is only found in our cameras. And I think it's probably the most fun feature that we have. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's actually really easy to do. Everybody looks at it and says, well, that must be really complicated. But because of Live Composite, it's actually really, really simple. Um, we've also added um, custom modes to the M5 Mark III. Um, in the past, you'd have to go into the menu and find my, what we called My Sets and actually find that in the menu. And you could save them, and then you could go back to them. But now you can just turn the dial to the C and revert back to whatever your favorite settings that you had saved before. So I think someone else here was asking, what's the best way, to, best way to get images to your computer or to your phone? So you were talking about getting them to your computer. Yes. But we also, well, these days, a lot of people like to put images directly on their phone and share them on, whether it's Facebook or just to email them or text them to somebody. So uh, the M5 Mark III has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And it's a very, very simple setup. We've actually updated our app, and it's actually one step now. Um, you literally just scan a, a, a QR code on the display on the camera. It'll connect to it. And you're only going to do that the first time. And then from there on out, you can just fire up that app, connect to Wi-Fi, and, and transfer all of your images, or just the ones that you select, right over to your phone. And what Bluetooth does, Bluetooth actually does, isn't used to transfer the images, but it's used to trigger your, your phone to go and connect via Wi-Fi and look for it. So if you shut your phone off or your camera off, um, it will then, uh, and you've marked pictures to be transferred, it will then uh, ping your phone. Your phone will connect, and it will automatically transfer those images. This camera can shoot very fast. It has an 8,000th of a second high-speed shutter, so you can shoot um, very fast action. I mean, 8,000th of a second is higher than I think most people um, have a regular need for, but the camera can certainly do it. And another uh, really useful feature is USB charging. Um, it's one of those things that I've, uh, we, we've been uh, asked for it for a while. The EM1X got it, and now the EM5 Mark III has USB charging. Um, it's standard USB. It's not USB power delivery, so you can use any USB charger. You can use an iPhone charger. You can use the, um, this charger here, the F5AC, uh, is available as an accessory. Um, but if you have a, a, TG, uh, a TG6 or a TG5, the same charger comes with it, and you can use that to charge your M5 Mark III. Um, I actually plug it in in my car. I just plug it into the a USB port in my car. Um, I haven't taken my batteries out of um, out of my EM1X since I 
gotten it um, just because I'm always plugging it in. Um, and this camera is no different. I'm always going to have this. Anytime I have the opportunity to plug it into USB and keep it topped off, I'm going to do that. It's just much easier than carrying another charger with you if you don't have to. And then there are some um, accessories available for uh, this camera. I think one of them here, this one has the grip, the ECG5 grip. And what the grip does, just if you have larger hands or you like just a little bit more of a handhold, adds that extra grip onto the, the camera. It's not a battery grip, doesn't have a, a, a place for another battery, but it does add another shutter release and front dial. Um, and it's a really nice accessory. And then we also have our entire line of flashes. Now, all of our flashes are compatible. The reason we show these three, the FL900, the 700, and the STF8 macro flash, is because these three are weatherproof. Because uh, as I mentioned before, the M5 Mark III is a weatherproof body. Um, so if you use it with a pro lens or one of our weatherproof lenses and one of these flashes, their whole system is weatherproof. So um, they'll all work for fill flash, depending. Th they're all TTL flash. Um, and they'll all work as a fill flash. And if you use them, if you pair it with um, our wireless remote commander, the FC, I believe it's the FCWR, or FC, F, FCWR commander, um, you can trigger an infinite number of FL700s uh, with wireless radio wave, which is, which is pretty neat. Um, so that is everything that I have about the EM5 Mark III. Um, does anybody have any questions? I know it was a, a lot of technical stuff. But I'd love I'd love some questions if anybody has any. How many years does it take to learn it? <laughs> it's actually pretty simple. I mean it's there's a lot to the camera, but one of the one of the, the, the main features of all OMDs is something called super control panel. So if you're familiar with our products, yes we do have a pretty robust menu, has a lot of options. But most of the functions that you're going to use on a regular basis, you're going to get to just by pressing the OK button. And it'll bring up something called the Super Control Panel. And this is um, all of your basic features, ISO, um, autofocus modes, drive mode, um, white balance. All of those things are right there. And, and it's a touch screen. So you can just tap the section you want to adjust. You press OK. If I wanted to adjust ISO, I'm simply going to tap ISO. And I'm going to just rotate the dial. Um, yeah, so it's very, very simple. Um, you might have to go into the, the menu and set your camera up a little bit when you first get it. Um, however, once you do that, um, you're pretty much good to go. And you can do almost everything with the super control panel. And it's very simple. Is there a book of, that goes beyond the manual? There's a lot on YouTube, a lot online. Um, there are companies that write other books. but. Well, so there's a company called Rocky Nook that, that writes books um, based on Olympus products. Um, the, the problem with books, and not just for Olympus, for all manufacturers. Um, a lot of manufacturers put out updates for cameras, firmware updates that may, and I think we do it more than anybody, is we put out new features. Um, the EM, uh, EM1 Mark II just got um, a huge update that essentially made it a new camera. But when we do that and we add new features, it kind of invalidates a lot of books that have been out there for a while. So the, the most up-to-date information you're going to find is going to be um, YouTube videos. We put out videos. Um, many of our users and some of our visionaries put out, put out videos and tutorials. Um, and, and they're very, very helpful. And I think that would probably get you through, um, through almost any situation. And we're always happy to help, too. We have, we have a great customer service department. If I could just add one thing. Uh, during previous trainings I've been doing over the last couple of weeks, we find it very simple for our employees behind the counter to explain two different ways to use the camera. The scene mode, SCN, and the OK button. I'd rather not call it the super control panel, just because I can't remember that. Press the OK button and that panel shows up. It's the top 25 features that are most often used in the camera. Pop that up, go down and across on the arrow, hit OK, and you're in. OK. On the scene mode, it operates a different way for an even less experienced photographer. Hit the scene mode, yep. and the top six things will show up. There's action, there's portrait, there's landscape, there's night stuff. Go to those That's buttons, this. and the top three or four features of that, like nightscape, you'll yep. find that pre-shot mode, and you'll find yep. the uh, time exposure mode, the live bulb. The yeah, live and, that, and that's a graphic interface. So if you turn to scene mode, you're going to get, again, um, you're going to get six boxes up here that show people, nightscapes, uh, motion, scenery, close-ups, and indoors. But if you go into those, can they still shoot raw? Yes. 
You can. You can. You can select raw in prior to shoot, prior to entering those modes. Any other questions I can answer? If I shoot at night with a fast five and high ISO without the tripod, that's what I want. I I hate well, image stabilization is going to help you out a tremendous. The question was, can I? Can you shoot? Can you shoot at night, wide open with a fast aperture prime, without a tripod and high ISO? So, as far as high ISO performance, um, of course, with any camera, you're going to hit a threshold where you're going to start to see some noise, right? Um, you can comfortably, I would say, go up to 3,200 and even 6,400 with with this camera. Um, it goes as far as 25. It goes up to 25,600, but you're going to see noise at 25,000. But that's, that comes down to the difference between do I need to do that to get a picture or not have a picture at all? Right. So that's the trade-off at that I point. But if you want a good picture, I would try and keep it under 6,400, under 3,200 if you, if you can. 6,400 6, is really kind of the threshold. That's the native ISO range where you might start to, to see some noise creep is in. That um, ISO. You can do auto ISO up to 6400, and after that, you, you're, you're in manual ISO. Um, but yeah, you can, once you, if you're talking about a fast aperture prime like our 1.2 series, and we have those here for you to take a look at, um, then you should be able to shoot in low light um, with a higher ISO without a problem. Anything else? Any other questions? Some of the reviews on the camera said that you talked about the USB battery. Mm -hmm. So it's rated at 310 shots. Now we know from all of our products, not just this one, that in practice you're going to get a lot more. That uses something called the SEPA measurement standards or SEPA rating standards, um, which they take pictures with a very specific set of circumstances and that's how they measure battery life. So like the EM1 Mark II is rated at 450 shots, but I mean, and Frank's a regular user of the EM1 Mark II, I would say I, I never get less than 1,000 shots out of my EM1 Mark II. Obviously we can't advertise that. Uh, you know, in, in, on a spec chart, but in practice, it, it, and it can vary a lot by how much you use your rear monitor, how, um, you know, how much your image stabilization unit's active, all sorts of different things, but you'll definitely get a lot more than the actual rating in practice most of the time. I mean, I, I you know, three, if, you're, if it's rated at over 300 shots, you're, you're going to get probably a, at minimum of 500 in reality. Well, there's only two cameras right now that we make that do it, the EM1X and the EM5 Mark III, and this, this camera hasn't even shipped yet. So, um, yeah. Well, I was surprised yeah. Stuff. It's, been a, it's been a request for, yeah, for, a, request. Yeah, for a little while. Yeah. Questions. Anything else? Um, there's a microphone built into the camera, but then there's also a microphone jack on the side of the body. So if you wanted to use, whether it's one of our recorders, we have something called the LSP4, that is a, 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 a digital voice recorder um, that can, you can mount on the hot shoe and just plug into the side, um, or any other, any other video microphone, um, or you can use the internals. Um, obviously, an external microphone is going to give you better quality for sure. There's no built-in flash. There is no built-in flash. It does include a small flash in the box called the FL-LM3. It's a little wa weatherproof flash um, that's powered off of the camera. It's not a pop-up. It's not pop-up. It's, it's an external flash. It's about that big. I don't happen to have one with me. I don't know if you have one, Jim. Um, but, it just, it's, it, but it comes with the camera in the box. It's, it comes with it. It comes with the flash in the box. Um, the guide number is seven in meters, so it's not, a, it's not a very powerful flash. But it's good for a little bit of fill flash when you're shooting portraits or something. And it's weatherproof. And it bounces into a tilt. Yeah, tilts and bounces too. And single or double card slot. Single card slot. Single. Again, this camera is one of our. This camera is intended for people that are probably going to be doing a bit of travel and and going to be on the go. So we made it as small as we can, but that that meant having one card slot. I just wanted. I'm sorry. Just wanted to add one thing. The camera is going to be available as a body only and as a one lens kit. You can buy it if you already own lenses. You can get it that way. And we're also putting it together for sale with a kit with a 28 to 300 millimeter equivalent. We call it a 14 to 150. And that's on the table with the grip. So it makes a nice travel package because you're going to, whatever you're going to shoot in this travel, it's going to fall between that wide angle 
and a 300 millimeter telephoto, but it's that big. So it's available two ways, and silver and black. The person start out with a zoom lens before prime lens. That's personal. That's, I mean, that that's depends on, I mean, you seem to know a lot about photography or have the right questions, but that's all relative. You were asking me earlier whether you should use five prime lens with it, and that's personal. Yeah, I mean, a zoom offers a lot of flexibility, but, you know, so does the prime. <laughs> Somebody asking, what's better, the black one or the silver one? <laughs> I'm buying the black one. The silver one. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Good question. Any other questions? Before I turn it over to Frank? And he has the more, the more fun presentation. Much better pictures. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Frank Smith. You, can you get me to, uh, all right. There we go. And there you go. And the clicker is here. Yep. Good afternoon. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Matt. That was great. Anytime uh, he sh does some of these presentations, I learn some things along the road, so I'm appreciative of all of that. Well, thank you for inviting me here today. And one of the uh, uh, things that we discussed prior to me uh, doing a presentation is, what should we talk about? And I do several things, and you know, Jim was saying, well, hey, this camera's designed for travel. Let's talk about travel. So with your permission, I decided we'd talk about some global landscapes. And uh, without any further ado, let's take a look at what's in here. So I want to tell you a little bit about the presentation. I'm going to be quick. I'm going to go through this on a fast pace. So if I'm going too fast, just yell to me and slow me down. I'll try to do that. Tell you a little bit about myself and the equipment. And then uh, I'm going to chat with you a little bit about the travel part of this thing. And during the travel, I'm going to share with you at least some of the things that go through my head as it relates to composition and juxtaposition and things of that nature. So with that being said, let us jump into this. So one of the things I don't know if you're aware of, but there's a visionary team that we have at Olympus, and there's, um, there's a, a dozen of us across uh, North America, all with different uh, skill sets and so forth. And uh, if you ask me to take uh, baby pictures for you, this is you're probably asking the wrong guy. But if you're interested in travel and landscape, uh, I do a fair amount of um, photojournalism work. Um, and of course the travel arena that's that's my sweet spot so that's what I want to that's what we're going to chat about so this is my bio you can see this on the Olympus web page um, there as I mentioned there's a dozen of us across North America all with different skill sets with uh, all very very talented photographers I, you know these guys are really wonderful and if you have the opportunity to hear any of them or chat with any of them please reach out they're, they're very good people so let me share with you a little bit about my equipment we're not gonna this is not a uh, presentation on equipment that's what uh, Matt was kind enough to chat about so this is kind of my toolkit and I don't travel with all of the stuff you see on here my workhorse though uh, comes down I'm, I'm packing two cameras for me it's the OMD EM1X and now the EM5 Mark III. And the portability of that for me as a travel photographer is just fabulous. Because of the weight, uh, I, need, I need portability, I need flexibility, but I can't sacrifice quality. So this system is pretty much designed, I think, you know, if, if, if I had to go in somebody's minds in the engineering department, I think they jumped in my head and said, all right, let's design this camera for Frank. So camera systems, I should say. And for me, it just is a, is a great tool and works great. So as Matt mentioned, this is the new EM5 Mark III. The emphasis being in this picture, you can see is the waterproof or the water resistant aspect of this thing. And the other camera that I mentioned I shoot is the EM1X. Those are my two workhorses at this point. So with that being said, Let's do some traveling. Uh, I'm going to take you. I picked a handful of locations that uh, that I've traveled to, and you can see on the screen here some of the locations I've picked. I'm going to move quickly through some of these things, and again share with you some of the things that went through my head when I photographed them. And um, uh, I guess we'll start off with the Atacama Desert. Any anybody here familiar with that? It's and most people are not. It's the it is the largest arid desert in the world. And it spans uh, three uh, countries, Peru, Chile, and Argentina. Yeah, it's, most people don't realize that. South America. In South America, yes, sir. And the thing of it is with this location is that it is probably, when people say, what's, what's one of the most gorgeous places you've been to? I would have to say this is at the very top of the list for me. Um, it's like 
it is, it's very, very barren, it's very remote. Temperatures go up to about 100 degrees during the day. They go below freezing at night. Nothing lives there. It is very, very, very barren. But no, these are a whole host of cameras over the years that I've taken. So the, the EM5 Mark III, I'm going to share some images if we have time at the end with you from what I shot with the uh, Mark III, because we've only had that, I've only had it just a, a little over four weeks now. So um, I can't, I'm, I'm a fast traveler, but not that fast. So anyway, with the Atacama Desert, uh, you heard Matt talk about some of the uh, components that are built into this. I'm changing lens, lenses and harsh windstorms and things of that nature, and the Atacama Desert's a perfect example of that. What you see here is all these amazing, what appears to be almost art structures, but it's as a result of the volcanoes a million years ago with these beautiful pumice uh, structures. And what I like about Atacama is if you go to the same place the next day to take the same photograph, you can't do it. And the reason being is Mother Nature changes the palette on us. The sand patterns you see there, every day it's different. And what's appealing, again, is it, there's nothing man-made in these locations. One of the most difficult places to get to, it uh, took a couple days of uh, four-wheeled uh, vehicles. We had to carry our own gas or on water in the middle of this desert. But for me, one of the most beautiful places I've seen. And um, uh, the, the landscapes are just amazing. Yes, sir? Atacama, A-T-A-C-A-M-A, -A -A, Atacama Desert. Yeah, most people haven't. It's it's this amazing gem that's that's there. Well, thank you. Well, unfortunately, there's nothing man-made there, so that's usually what we relate to. So we don't have that option. So, well, I could, but I'm I'm not typically a model shooter. But I'll consider that uh, the next time I'm there. Here's a shot where, at first glance, you can see all the waves in the ocean, but obviously that's not ocean, that's sand. It's that optical illusion that you see there. Um, it's, uh, uh, and again, if you go there the next day to try to replicate it, you can't because it, Mother Nature gives us a new palette every, every single day. But it's a harsh terrain. Uh, they counseled us when we went there to make sure you have special shoes with special uh, soles on them because it's a glass-type material. Uh, it'll eat through a regular pair of shoes in a heartbeat and you don't want to fall because it's very, very um, uh, challenging from the perspective that you can cut yourself very easily on this. So when I'm photographing, I, I'm always looking for layers. I'm looking for, you know, foreground, midground, background. And in this particular example, what caught my eye was the sun was setting and beautiful light on the mountain in the background, but I also wanted to incorporate the cracked sand surface that you see in the foreground. So. A lot of my imagery you'll see where I try to uh, include uh, layers in my imagery and also always looking for um, leading lines. In this particular case, uh, this was shot at probably the worst time of the day. The sun was at its harshest, but we make do with that. We take advantage of the shadows that are there. And hopefully that uh, curved line in this image takes you into the picture and creates a little sense of interest of that. This is an example again of kind of like a mirage if I hadn't told you where I was before, you might look at this and ask me what the body of water is that you see in the foreground. Of course, that's all sand again and at very warm temperatures. But yet what appealed to me is you notice all the layers in the background of the mountains and you can see what appears to be like some type of mist or something. It's not mist, it's dust because again, I'm in a very uh, dry, arid, sandy location uh, for here. This was taken at night. Um, it, the, there's uh, two places that I've traveled where I felt like I could actually touch the stars with my hand because it's so clear. There is zero light pollution. And the beauty of this is because it's so low in moisture and that uh, it's, it's so pure, it's one of the best places in the world to see the uh, stars at night. And in setting this up, you'll notice uh, that star in kind of the upper left-hand corner. I tried to get the rock formation that has that opening kind of aligned with that. So when I'm photographing, I'm constantly looking for opportunities like that in my composition. So I move myself, move my feet to get the locations where, you know, it gives something a little more compelling to the image. So the question that begs to be asked on this image is, how did I light the foreground? And I didn't. Uh, this is a, you know, a, probably a 20 second exposure when I'm doing still stars. I try not to exceed that. But there was a moon over my shoulder, which gave me the light that you see there. That's not uh, 
uh, man-made light. However, in this case, I wanted to photograph the Milky Way and I wanted that uh, mountainous structure in the foreground in the lower left in the picture. In that case, we had a walkie-talkie and I radioed to the guy in the truck and said, can you hit your headlights just for a second so that I could give a little bit of depth and give you a little bit more of how this image, uh, you know, I wanted you to see it, if you will. And uh, the Milky Way is just tack sharp in tandem with the, uh, the lit part of it. Uh, on this one, yes, I definitely did. Yeah, because these are probably in that 20 sec. If I'm not, if it's, if, it's, uh, if it's stars, again, my rule of thumb is I try not to exceed about 20 seconds uh, for, for my exposures. This is a little bit further north. Uh, this is uh, a, an area where they or not matrix, they collect the alkaline in here for our batteries that we all use and that water is extremely uh, uh, high intensity with the alkaline and the uh, salt. Um, you, you can't drink it, uh, but yet it makes for some great reflections and some really nice opportunities. So allow me to take you to something a little closer to home, and this is some imagery from the southwest. Um, uh, many of you have traveled there. This is the Grand Canyon, and you know, always looking for that magic moment when you've got uh, some color, you've got shadows, you've got highlights, and uh, blending them together to create some fun imagery. Zion, this was a uh, two or three hour hike, and there's a uh, 2,000 foot drop on one side and a 3,000 foot drop on the other. So it's a good thing I had image stabilization in my camera by the time I got up to the top of this thing. This is a Bryce sunrise shot. Again, we've seen many images like this, but uh, uh, again, for me, the key times here are both sunrise and sunset. So this is in the Slot Canyons, and we've seen plenty of images on this. I shot this uh, five or six years ago, and the reason I share this with you, and that it's in, there's a reason it's in vertical, uh, because we've had advancements in technology. So the last time I was there, you'll notice there's no sky in this picture, and by purpose, because I wanted to get as much dynamic range as I could, and with the newer technologies today, I'm able to now incorporate some of the skies into the pictures. I will show, share those with you just momentarily. This is a uh, pano of the um, Dead Horse State Park uh, in that uh, region. It's just one of the most gorgeous locations, uh, you know, outside of Moab there. Of course, we've all seen the, you know, horse, uh, Horseshoe Bend. And for me, shooting at both sunrise and sunsets are the, uh, are the appropriate times to capture it. And if you look closely, maybe you can see Forrest Gump running down the street here. And of course, this is that's famous spot where, you know, he was running in, uh, in his uh, movie. So here are the images that I said fast forward, you know, five plus years after the previous uh, set of slot canyons. Now I'm including skies, now I'm including kind of the full range of this because the sensors now and the cameras have improved so much, it allows me that much more flexibility. Uh, so I'm able to pull, if you look carefully, you'll see the details around the perimeter of all of these rocks, the colors are just absolutely brilliant and every place you go it's a different opportunity so um, I just you know I love looking up and allowing my mind to wander a little bit and come up with creative elements as how as I could shoot as how I could shoot this would I like a little cloud in the middle of some of that blue sky absolutely yes but uh, you know we can't get everything we want so any event uh, it's a it's a it's a fun fun place to photograph in those same slot canyons, we made arrangements at night to go in there and photograph them. And this is a series of star trails. And uh, for me, it was one of the most peaceful uh, experiences to be in this slot canyon where there's normally a lot of people. And for the, to be, there was a total of three of us in this place. It was absolutely gorgeous. This is probably about a uh, 45 minute to an hour exposure using a live comp that you heard Matt you know, talk about a little bit earlier. This is one of the kivas uh, in the area. It's not on any maps. It's a really, really difficult hike to get to. And uh, of course, we wanted to photograph it at sunset, but we also have some images after dark, which uh, is just beautiful looking through this uh, canyon wall. But the challenge is if you do that and there's no real trails, is hiking out of there at uh, midnight is not uh, something I advise if you don't have to. So here is uh, one of the arches outside of Moab. Uh, and, uh, Monument Valley, and uh, 
Of course, I wanted to get the uh, stars limiting myself to about a 20 second exposure. Put a little LED light at the base of this so you could see definition of the arch, but yet at the same time I want to be careful. I don't want to uh, have that mitigate the stars that you see. So it's always that balance and blend of how much to put in it. But that wasn't my ultimate objective with this image. What I wanted to do is I wanted to get the stars in the picture. So I'm on a tripod, I'm in the exact same location, and you can see, as Matt mentioned with the live composite, I don't get overexposure. It's probably about an hour uh, shot here uh, and uh, getting all the star trails in it. But what I was really after was uh, Delicate Arch, which is the arch you see on all the license plates uh, in Arizona. And uh, I wasn't sure how the conditions were going to be. You can see the stars in the, in the uh, background there, along with these clouds and a little bit of light from the, uh, uh, the town that's there. So I thought, you know, what my objective was, was I wanted this, but what, it, what I really wanted was this image here. And this is the image that I use in the back of my business card. It's one of my favorites. Again, same thing as I mentioned to you before, we put a little LED at the base. This is about midnight, one o'clock in the morning, uh, just myself and my buddy, nobody else there. It was absolutely fabulous. Uh, and to have this place to ourself and be in a position to photograph and get these type of images was, you know, far exceeded my expectations. So allow me to take you to a different part of the world. India is the one country that I have traveled the most to. I've been to the north, south, east, and west of this country. And it is my, one of, probably at the top of my list for favorite places to photograph because I just love the culture, I love the people. Uh, it's just, a, and it's an ever-changing palette there also. This is in Kashmir, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, you'll notice a lot of the haze that you see in these images. Uh, reason being is everything is heated, everything that they cook with is all wood. But what's interesting about uh, Kashmir in this particular area called Dow Lake, everything is done on the lake. Commerce is done on the lake, uh, they live on the lake, their gardens are on the lake, everything is on the lake, and it's one of the most amazing places I've seen. Hundreds of years ago, this used to be a very popular destination for travelers of you know, Europe and pretty much all across Asia, but there's a lot of turmoil there now. But in this particular image, this uh, took place at six o'clock in the morning. That's when they conduct their commerce. I think it's like every other day that they come there. It lasts 20 minutes. They uh, barter and sell their wares and produce and so forth. And 20 minutes later, it's gone. So if you decide you want to photograph this and you miss it by 20 minutes, you've missed the opportunity. Uh, but just, uh, you know, amazing location. But if you see in the background that, uh, that heavy smoke that's there, that's one of the characteristics that uh, you'll see in Kashmir. So traveling a little bit further north of Kashmir, I'm now on the Pakistan border uh, up uh, in the well into the Himalayas. And you can see where the clouds are. I'm well above the clouds, but what, it's just an amazingly beautiful area. Not well inhabited, uh, but yet from a photography standpoint, I just absolutely enjoyed it. Uh, my composition on this is you see the three structures. We like threes. I made that my foreground. The kind of mid-ground is the portion of the mountain. Then you go in, into the mountain areas and see all that fog and mist. And it just, uh, for me, from a compositional standpoint, just blends well together by introducing those different layers into the image. And every once in a while, you'll see uh, an opportunity. In this case, where I'm pretty high up in the mountains at this point, and the sun is peeking through at just small parts. And it just illuminates the very top part of the mountain that you see in the mid-ground there. And for me, that was the time I was trying to capture it, not the having the whole mountain lit or you know a larger portion, but this the segment that you see in this image. And again, a minute later, that opportunity is gone. Yes, sir. So, okay, so the question is about the dynamic range and, you know, how I can capture as much of that as we can. I shoot only raw, so I've got a lot of data available to me. Available to me. So I'm always trying to get my exposure as right as I can so that I can make sure that I have enough information in the shadows 
and in the highlights. So it's always a constant struggle to try to get that uh, metering just right. But if you do, unless it's extreme conditions, there's that much data that I can extract from the raw image that will allow me to present to you to all of the, both, uh, you know, the highlights and the shadows. And that's particularly, that's the case in that particular image. This is a, an image I shot with a long telephoto. I was photographing through some uh, uh, tree leaves and that's why if you see it looks a little soft around the perimeter. I wanted that and uh, for me the juxtapositioning on this thing was just worked very well. Kind of a tender moment uh, where she is with uh, you know, some of the cattle and you have the other cattle looking on. You can't pose something like this and it just have to, you have to be prepared when the, when, the, when the moment presents itself to take advantage of it. Uh, I think this is the EM-1. Yeah, I think that one was the EM-1, so you're going to test me on some of that. And some of the challenges in when you're in an area like this is, you know, when you're ready to leave, you say you're going to pack up, uh, you have to wait for sometimes the cattle or the, uh, the traffic jams to clear, and I'm not talking about the automobiles, of course, but this is a constant occurrence in many, you know, many of these parts of the world, if you will. And this is looking down the valley, heading back down towards Kashmir, just lovely as could be, you know, a lush, lush, part of the world, uh, but a challenging part of the world nonetheless either. And you'll notice there's no people in the pictures. So this is an area called Leh and Ladakh. This is also another northern uh, portion uh, of uh, India, separate from Kashmir. And this is the road system, and this is on a good day. It's, I'll tell you what, uh, the first time I was on this, I, uh, I was a little concerned to say the least, but it's beautiful. Yeah, you can, and there's vehicles that they say have, but and nobody's ever found them. But uh, any event, uh, this is you know a typical travel day in Leh and Ladakh. That happens to be uh, uh, a herder off to the right of a section of the road that we just came from. But we are well into the uh, uh, high elevations of the Himalayas in, these, in this part of the country, but just beautiful, um, you know beyond anything like I've seen in this, with this terrain. And what I do in a situation like this, we noticed the prayer flags along the side of the road, so I wanted to get a shot of that with, again, the foreground, the midground, and the background. Again, I'm always thinking about those layers. And with the wind blowing, I purposely slowed my shutter speed down so you can see the blur in the flags, but yet everything else is tack sharp in the image. And this is uh, uh, one of the better road sections of road where we are in an area of India where most, most people would say, well, that's not India because India is so populated. This area is very, very desolate. And, uh, uh, but again, in my mind's eye, just beautiful uh, and, a, and a lovely place to photograph. What caught my eye here was the, um, the wisping of the clouds you see and how the sun was just reflecting on the road and hopefully that creates a little bit of a leading line that takes you kind of into the valley and into the picture, if you will. And for me, I found the black and white work better because it wasn't distracting from, you know, some of the color could have been a distraction as far as me trying to get that point across. And then again, another section just looking down into the various valleys. And we're traveling hundreds of miles through this part of the country and that's what it's like pretty much the whole way. And if you look closely to the right-hand side and you see that little bit of crack in the rock, there were two vehicles we were traveling with and if you look closely, that's the other vehicle in the crack of that uh, outcropping there. Just to give you an idea of uh, size and depth and to your earlier point, sir, about putting something in it man-made, in this particular case, um, I got a shot of, uh, of the car as we were making our way into that valley. And along the roadways, similar to maybe what we see out in the west, looks like the hoodoos here, but it's whatever they refer to them in this part of the world, just gorgeous, uh, you know, uh, non-man-made structures, just natural structures all along the way. And the challenge here is being able to keep moving because you see so many of these things along the way where you just want to constantly stop and photograph them. This is one of the Zans. It's like, uh, they call it Z-A-U-N, uh, like a monastery. And I use this picture a lot when I am discussing layers. You see layers in the image. Of course, the tree is the foreground, then we have water, then we have more mid-ground, and then the main subject matter is kind of right in the middle. And beyond that, there are layer and layer and layer of 
mountains, and then you have the clouds beyond it. So the human eye loves layers, and this is you know the example that I use when you have the opportunity to utilize um, an image like this. this. This usually works well. So this, when you're not on the sections where it's more controlled, this is what the road system looks like. And the problem with this type of road system is inevitably this happens, and we we're very, very fortunate. There was a work crew uh, not too far away that was able to help us dig out of this, and uh, had they not been there, we might still be there. I don't know. It was pretty tough, tough sand in that area. So this is now South India. Uh, the environment changes completely, much more lush in this area. Um, there is um, uh, an area right around Kerala was where these were, photographs were taken and again there's a lot of waterways here and we actually stayed on a it's a type of houseboat where we went up and down the riverways here and I was able to photograph all the scenery and the lifestyles of the people along the way it was just an amazing experience and then of course you have the daytime shop you want to make sure if you can get those beautiful sunsets and if you look closely at the lower left hand corner if you get a fisherman or somebody going by in a boat, which is what I tried to capture in this shot, is uh, putting that into, you know, making this image. This is uh, a little more central, but south. This is an area where the, uh, the tigers are. We went here looking for tigers. Didn't find any tigers, but found some amazing landscape opportunities. And a couple people said that looks like a painting, and why is that? It's pretty heavy and dense fog. And uh, so when I looked over at the rear of the vehicle that I was in, and I just saw you know, the, the roadway and the softness of this because of the fog, for me, it made for you know, a very compelling uh, landscape image. This is also in that same general area. And I always have to pause. Uh, I, I love the picture. You can see some uh, animals in the background there. Uh, but the reason I pause on this is, uh, Outdoor Photography did a story on me a few years ago, and uh, this is the image that they used on the lead part of the uh, story, so it's, uh, it's obviously near and dear to me. And of course, some friends that we'll see along the way uh, as we're cruising through this area. So now let me take you to an area called Chennai, uh, India. This is on the East Coast, a beautiful area, and on, on uh, Friday evenings, families gather on the beach area and they picnic and just, uh, you know, just have a nice family time. It's really a nice opportunity to see. And if you're lucky and you get a sky like that, which just makes the image that much more fun. So a lot of times when I'm photographing situations like that, in this particular case, I looked at this and I just saw the families gathering going into the water. But I want to try to portray some motion at the same time. So what do you do? Your option is to slow your shutter speed, capture more of that movement, both of the waves and the people, and be purposeful with some blur, but yet be as steady as you can so the image still has its crispness to it, if you will. What's your shutter speed here? I am going to guess maybe 30th of a second, something like that. 30th would be my guess. 30th of a second. That's, I guess, I don't, I'm not 100% sure, maybe the 25th, but somewhere in that neighborhood. So let me take you into the T region now. And again, these are just beautiful and lush and, you know, people introduced into situations and into imagery like this help make the image a little bit better. And if you can find, you know, somebody's head who's laying on top of the, uh, uh, the field, if you will, or the, uh, kind of being quite sarcastic, you get this young fellow who kind of poked his head up and it screamed, please take my picture, at least from my vantage point. And then at that same location, you know, this was uh, the women, this was one of the women who was making tea, they were on their break. So my purposefulness on this is I saw her doing this, I wanted to capture the tea in motion, and I also wanted to be very careful, I wanted her tack sharp, but I also wanted the woman in the background, I wanted to be careful that I didn't cut too much of her off, I wanted her hand in the picture, hands in the picture, plural, and her face, but I still want you to see the woman in the front as the primary subject. And from a compositional standpoint, that's how I look to try to tee this thing up. Of course, there's short opportunities because at some point she's going to drink the tea and she's going to be done. How many of you heard of the Kumbh Mela? The Kumbh Mela is the largest gathering of human mass in the world. And it takes place once every four years in an area of India called Alabad. And then they have a grand kum that takes place once every 144 years. 
I had the opportunity to be at the Grand Coombe uh, a couple years ago to be with 32 million people in a very, very small area that uh, is, was just one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And in looking at this image, this is when they started making their march toward the Ganges River. And the belief is that they go to the, their belief is they go to the Ganges, go into the river to cleanse their sins. So I'm trying to capture as much of this as I can. The good news for me is I'm tall, so I can get up higher than most people. And the good news is with the equipment we use, I have the screen that tilts over, so I'm able to hold my camera up as high as I can. So part of the question that begs to be asked is why is it a yellow tint? Because there's those high pressure sodium lights that they have sporadically throughout the area. Towards the end of the day then, they go back to their camp areas and this is really what I enjoy. I go into the camps, I try to you know communicate, make friends with these people. I'm not taking these pictures in a stealth form. They know I'm there. I'm trying to communicate with them where I have the opportunity and getting their permission before I photograph them. I am, for the most part, a wide-angle shooter, and in this particular case, I am probably 18 to 24 inches away from this gentleman. And again, from a compositional standpoint, I wanted the image, the roughness you see on his face. They put ash on their bodies, and I wanted to make sure I captured in a soft manner the gentleman you see to the lower right. So obviously, if I'm 18 to 24 inches away, they know I'm there. At some point, you know, I don't start photographing right away. I want to, you know, try to establish some forms of communication. And then after a while, I become secondary. And that's when the magic happens for me, just as in this next image. Again, these people, this was a different village, a different situation. But he is tack sharp. You can count the hairs on his beard. Uh, and all the while, from a compositional standpoint, I'm trying to be as careful as I can about getting the gentleman in the background in the picture without cutting any important parts of them off but I do want them soft as opposed to my foreground image, so I'm using a pretty wide aperture in order to accomplish that. So one of the gentlemen who turns out spoke very well English asked me to come sit next to him, and I had a delightful chat, and I asked somebody to quick grab a shot, and I think that is the EM5 that I am holding there. I'm not sure if it's the original or Mark II, but in any event, one of the things is they're very proud of their hair, so I said, well, sir, do you mind if I just get a shot of that so people back home can see the length of it? So a little bit longer than mine, he challenged me to let mine get that long, and I told him that uh, it might take a while, and we'll see if I can uh, do that or not. So all the years I've been traveling to India, though, some of the questions people have asked me is, have you photographed the Taj Mahal? And I've never done that until just a couple of years ago. So I made a point when I was in Agra to go over and photograph that. And this is a shot that I wanted to take ahead of time, just kind of a little bit of a scouting. It's a beautiful facility. So to get in there and get pictures of the Taj without people is a challenge. So what I did is the next morning, I got up as early as I could, made sure I was the first person in line. I ran as fast as I could to get to the front of the Taj and get the postcard shot, so to speak. So this is the effort that I had and the result that came with it. I purposely wanted the flowers in the foreground and the thing that's unique is if you look close, you might see one or two people in this image, and that's the extent of it. And then after I shot this, I went and took a whole series uh, in the back part, in the main part of the, uh, of the structure, and uh, you know, I'm just very happy. I could spend, I could do a whole presentation just on the Taj Mahal, but I won't do that to you. So allow me to take you to Gujarat. Uh, this is a uh, section of uh, India that I hadn't been before, kind of below Agra. And we were on the uh, salt flats here, and um, this was towards the end of the day, the beautiful sunlight hitting uh, you know, this uh, gentleman and his camel. I saw them coming along, and I went up and asked, would it be okay for me to grab a couple of photographs? He sits down, pulls out his cigarette, takes a break, and somebody says, is it a camel's cigarette? I said, Never mind. Anyway, uh, I don't know what it was, but uh, uh, he was kind enough to allow me to get a couple shots. But this, the light that you see, on the subject, you can't control from the standpoint of trying to recreate that. You've got to be there at the right moment. And when you're there at the right moment, be prepared to get those uh, type of images. This is in Rajasthan. Um, this was just uh, this past year, uh, a, a portion of India, again, I hadn't been to, and just lovely area. There's a lot of herders, sheep herders, and so forth in this part of the uh, country. And uh, what I wanted to do is 
photograph specifically some of these uh, opportunities. And if I can pause for a minute, talk about composition, juxtapositioning, and things of that nature. These guys stop. I am not going to get them to move. So what I have to do is move myself to get in a position that I can create an image that hopefully is compelling. And what I mean by that is both compositionally and lighting are very important. The thing that caught my attention, which hopefully you does your too, is these red turbans that uh, are unique to this part of the country. And all the while, I'm moving myself around trying to avoid overlap. And you'll notice the gentleman in the front, he's holding his cane. And I wanted that cane to be right in between the sheep. But at the same time, I wanted the gentleman in the background not to conflict and uh, try to avoid as much overlap. So all the while, this is the stuff that's going on in my head. And I am moving because I, I am not going to get the sheep and I'm not going to get the herders to move. So I have to move quickly and be prepared to try to capture it as best as I possibly can. So that's the thought process that went into creating that image. Um, there's a, a tradition there that uh, in the uh, one temple, these eagles come every day at five o'clock to be fed. And they said that they've been doing this for about a thousand years. And after they're fed, nobody knows where they go. They have been able to trace the eagles back. But it's an amazing experience to see and to know that they come there on a daily basis. And uh, this is a shot that uh, I try to get as many of them together. A couple people said, well, did you composite that? The answer is no. That's, I was fortunate enough as they were being fed to get a handful of them together in one shot. So allow me to take you to Bhutan. Uh, this is a, an area that uh, is, again, one of the prettiest places I've been to. Um, this is a, an early morning shot. I saw the uh, prayer flags. The uh, scene was filled with fog and it just started to burn off. And this is one of those opportunities, again, where you see it. Don't hesitate because 30 seconds after I took this picture, everything changed. The fog was no longer there. You see the yellow around the light. All of that was gone. It started to become very harsh. There's no more an opportunity. And it's not one of these things where you can say, oh, I'll come back there next week. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to be in that situation. So. When you see it and the opportunity presents, shoot it. So this is Tiger's Nest, uh, an amazing uh, place that's built into the side of this uh, rock uh, thousands of years ago. How they did it, I have no clue. Um, of course, I want to get closer. So when I do that and I get to those opportunities, I'm trying to think about composition and how can I get this image to work well, looking for leading lines. In this case, I use the flag as my, the flags as my leading lines and hopefully if I've done my job correctly, it'll take your eye into the structure and uh, again, create a little more of a compelling image, if you will. So in that same region, um, at the base, you know, I saw this beautiful bridge. And so when my eye catches something, I think, how can I photograph it? So that was not the shot that you see right here, but that was what triggered my mind to be thinking about what can I do? So I walked down to the bridge I notice the prayer flags and the wind is blowing. How do I get this image to work well? And this is how I captured it. This is the entrance to the uh, bridge that you saw in the preceding pictures. You'd notice the flags moving across the bridge with the one monk in the foreground. I waited for him to go through, or a monk. I wasn't specifically waiting for him. And a young fellow off to the left there looking out onto the waterway that you saw from the preceding picture. For me, I'm very happy with the way the image turned out, and this is what I was thinking about as I've been approaching the bridge. So I'm constantly thinking about the composition and the opportunity as I approach my subject matter, because when something happens, in the case of that monk going across the bridge, I'm not going to get him to come back and redo it. I mean, maybe you could, but uh, that's you know what I try to do. I look for unique situations. Here are some very high verticals. I just laid on my back on the bottom here and just wanted to shoot straight up with a uh, very wide angle lens. And this is also an early morning shot uh, where you've got this amazing fog uh, in these uh, wooded uh, forested area. And for me, just a very pleasant effect. And there's detail, if you look at the image, um, both in the light parts of the fog area and of course even into the very darkest part of this. And did I mention I was up high? Um, again, you can see from the clouds and the mountains below me, this is one of those elevations where it's, it's pretty significant. Uh, in the preceding trip, I was up at uh, uh, 17,100 feet, which uh, 
literally takes your breath away. Same elevation as base camp for Everest. I always look for these morning opportunities, and in this case, we had breaks of light coming through and the beautiful mist and fog rolling down the uh, mountainside with just a slight peak of uh, light coming through. And again, five minutes later, it changes, not, and it could be another five minutes after that, it changes even more so, but again, when you see it, shoot it. So, talk. I do, well, first of all, when I'm in a situation like this or an environment, the question is, what do I do with lenses? Do I change them frequently? I usually have two bodies around my neck with two different focal lengths. So as such, I'm not doing a lot of changing. And to your, this gentleman's question about the uh, prime versus uh, telephoto, foco, telephoto, in these environments, I'm using telephotos, zoom telephotos, if you will, uh, for these type because I need that versatility and in some of the cases where there's people and movement you've got split seconds to make a choice and that's why I don't have that ability maybe to be juggling lens today the lens that is on my camera the majority of the time is the 12 to 100 which is 24 to 200 equivalent which gives me a really broad versatility but my favorite lens is the 7 to 14 uh, which is 14 to 28 full frame equivalent I'm a wide angle shooter and that's bulk of what I like to do. But that's my favorite, but the bulk of the time, the one that I'm using the most is the 12 to 100. So anyway, uh, let me uh, take you out of this part of the world and take you to a location uh, a little bit south of us here in Cuba. Um, this is uh, an image that I'm very happy with. Uh, it's on the roof of one of the hotels. If there's a tourist bureau in Havana, my guess is this is not where they want they don't want this image, it's the other side where it's the newer, glitzier hotels. But for me, this says more of a picture of what uh, the area is like. And uh, I love the colors. The sky was fabulous. Again, these are at sunrise shots. Uh, just absolutely amazing. And then the opposite of this is the day I was leaving Havana, I went over to the lighthouse and uh, was able to capture a sunset. Uh, with this amazing dynamic sky and if you're familiar with the uh, Cuba uh, and Havana particularly that's the um, Malacan in the foreground that leads off to the right but Mother Nature delivered this amazing image or this amazing opportunity for me to ca capture this image and to give you more specific as far as where I was that lighthouse that you see in the background in this shot is where I was when I took that uh, that image this is, you know, a typical street scene. Again, what I like about it is the, the different components, the contrasts of the automobile versus the push cart, all the telephone lines you see on the top, uh, the muted colors. Uh, again, for me, this typifies, uh, you know, what I picture uh, in this particular region. As a matter of fact, this is one that Olympus has used many times in, in their marketing uh, brochures and one of my, one of my favorite images. And then every once in a while you can get on top of a rooftop and get lucky and have a dove maybe fly through the picture when you've got a sky that uh, complements it. So again, looking for those kind of opportunities. Let me take you further south. Uh, let's go back to uh, South America. This is um, uh, in Panama and Costa Rica. Uh, I like to do a lot of abstract type of things when I see with nature. and. So the trick is positioning your camera and your lens in different ways that you might not do otherwise. Simple example of that is with this particular, you know, um, fern type of plant, uh, just using the, the lines and the, the colors. And I'm not showing you the whole image, but for me, from an abstract perspective, this is some of the things that I like to do. And during my time there is when they just came out with the uh, 300 millimeter lens and I was asked to try to cap some, capture some images with it. And the images you see now, even though they're floral, I'm shooting with what is a 600 millimeter equivalent. And as you heard uh, Matt and Jim say, I'm hand holding all of these. There's no tripods. I have to admit I did chuckle because a lot of my peers that were with me were all sitting at their, their uh, cameras and on their tripods and I've got the shot and I'm moving on to the next one but I won't spend a lot of time on that. And here's one where again for uh, flower photography you don't th typically think about using a 600 millimeter equivalent but I will tell you that the the, uh, the flora and the fauna that are in this image uh, are as tack sharp as 
you're ever going to get if you want a pixel peep and look at these in real close uh, range. It's unbelievable the detail that I have uh, with this. Again, all handheld. And uh, somebody asked Matt the question about some of the uh, ISO settings. In a lot of these cases, I'm shooting at 5,000 ISO on average because I'm in a very, very dark uh, canopied uh, forested area and I don't have a lot of light to work with, so it's, you know, that's, that's what I got to push it to. It's handheld or tripod? You're, everything you're seeing right now is handheld, sir. Everything is handheld. What is zoom? Um, this is a 300 uh, uh, prime um, uh, and uh, 600 millimeter equipment that I'm using here. And some of these I may have the teleconverter on, which would give me the equivalent of 840 millimeters, again, handheld. So uh, I chuckle because I'm getting these shots, and as I said earlier, my friends are still uh, setting up their gear, but I won't spend a lot of time on that. Beautiful segments of the forest that uh, without that telephoto length, I would not be able to get these type of shots. And um, again, on average, I'm probably 5,000 ISO on the majority of the pictures that you're seeing in this uh, jungled area here. This one was very, sir? 5,000 ISO, yes, sir. Uh, and this one I know for sure because I just I wanted to double check it to make sure that I was telling you the right data. But this is one of those examples where uh, this is a, a, an image that you cannot create. So I saw the bird. I uh, noticed the pocket of light. He was in the shadow. There was no sense in me wasting my time taking shots of him while he was in the shadow. I waited until it moved itself into the light. And that's, again, where the magic happens. And that's why, again, part of the thing about photography is patience if you're dealing with things that are moving. In this particular next case here, also in a very um, dark canopied area, you see mom holding uh, the little one there and I'm assuming dad taking care of the hairdo for the day, I'm not sure. But uh, again, very tender moment and uh, an opportunity, but a couple seconds later, it changes. And you know, if you don't catch it, you're gonna, you're gonna miss it. So let me take you to uh, yet another part of the world, Mongolia. Uh, this, I'm in the western part of Mongolia, right near the China border. It's probably one of the, outside of the Atacama Desert, probably one of the most remote areas I've ever been to, but beautiful beyond my expectation. And uh, I mentioned there were two locations that I felt like I could touch the stars. Well, this is the other location. and. Uh, just skies that were amazing and again I can't describe what it was like and you know the images hopefully will give you some taste for it and this is a shot of the uh, uh, one person who was traveling with me they were in this tent and what did I do to get the tent to have some definition what we did is we took a little tiny candle and just put it in the in the um, in the tent while I was able to capture the image and again probably about a 20 second exposure and that's what I wanted to achieve and then this next image here, that's where I slept. That's, they call it a girt in that part of the world. And uh, what I did for this image is it's a three hour exposure. I went out and just put my uh, uh, flashlight on the tent just for a second uh, to give it a little bit of light. This is live composite. This is a three hour exposure. I went in back in there, fell asleep, set my alarm for three hours, got up and that's what awaited me was a raw image that you see there is three hours of, uh, of time exposure on it. Just amazing what you can do with this. And I purposely looked for the North Star so I knew where the circle was going to be. So I'd ha hopefully have uh, that when I, uh, when I awoke. But the colors in Mongolia are just magical. And that's a part that I wasn't sure I'd expected. But the reason I went to Mongolia, the primary reason is I wanted to get the eagle hunters. And I'm worried that that's a dying breed. And my intention was to try to document as much of that as I could and got to spend some time with several of the eagle hunters. And uh, they were kind enough to pose for us. And uh, just was an amazing experience. And if you look in the background, again, you'll notice there's absolutely nothing man-made. These are some very barren parts of the world. And uh, with this fella, he was uh, uh, kind enough to allow us to bring him up to the top of this one mountain and uh, catch him just at sunset. And if you look at the light on his face, you know, a couple people said, how did I light him? Mother Nature lit, lit him. I didn't. That's how the sun was. So when I'm traveling these parts of the world, I'm very minimalistic as far as my equipment. I'm taking lots of light sets. So again, as you, know, you heard me say earlier, that's the ideal um, scenario with the equipment that I use is it allows me 
that portability to be in these type of locations. Anybody know where this is? This is actually in Morocco, and I didn't realize the uh, uh, Roman Empire went to that extent, but it's interesting. There's a lot of interesting uh, uh, structures here, and all of these are being shot with very wide angle. As I mentioned, that's, that's kind of my favorite go-to. In composition, you know, I wanted to make sure I don't cut off any of the columns, and also it's important to me where you have long shadows like that, I don't want to cut the shadows off either. I want to try to incorporate as much of that into the image. But what I went there for was this type of thing. And this is in Sheshavan. Uh, and again, the people mistake it for Greece, but this is uh, uh, Morocco. And it's beautiful because it's in a valley or in an alleyways that the light just bounces and reflects all over the place, creating these amazing images. And of course, the gentleman you see up there with his cane against the wall and the beautiful yellow robe just works so well with it. And this is a, an example where I don't shoot children's faces typically, and I found the scene, I positioned myself, and I waited for something to happen, and this young lady with the beautiful red uh, jumpsuit on, suit on goes walking through, and I'm able to uh, capture the image. I'm going to take you into Iceland. Uh, again, I'm sure you've seen many images from here, but this is fall, which is typically a time that you don't see a lot of people go to, and uh, just, again, trying to work with shadows. And this is the flip side of that church that you saw in the preceding picture. Um, you know, always trying to be sensitive to the composition. And at sunset, uh, this old broke down Jeep here, and, uh, you know, again, looking for dynamic skies and opportunities like that. But the one thing with Iceland that I've learned is where the ice structures are, if you can get the sun to hit them in a way, you can't, by looking at this picture, actually tell where the sun's coming from because it's bouncing back and forth off of the ice structures that you see in there. So again, those type of opportunities are unique to places like that. And again, I mentioned layers. We've got the foreground. We've got that beautiful circle. I wish I could have positioned the one iceberg a little bit more to the side. I can't do that. So you take with what you get. And um, now, you heard uh, Matt and Jim talk about Pro Capture. This is a, an example where I used it. Uh, you never know when the geyser is going to pop. So if I have my finger on and I have it set, I can go ahead and catch it just as each one of these sequences takes place. And you don't miss the opportunity where, again, if I didn't have that Pro Capture, I probably would not have caught the very start of the, uh, of the geyser there. Uh, I look for little nuggets of uh, our components, and this is in one of the waterfalls area, and what's interesting is, and this is done purposely, you can't tell if that's 300 feet in height or three inches in height. So I'll keep you guessing on that one. Here's um, one of the more famous locations, but what is appealing, of course, is the, uh, the uh, rainbow that occurs, and you can tell by the clouds up above that this is a long exposure. So I thought about the live composite. So here I am getting set up with a neutral density filter to take a live composite of this scene. And this is the result. And it creates this amazing, beautiful painterly effect in the sky because as, as was mentioned, it only measures new light. And the only new light into a scene like this is the clouds moving. And it gives you that painterly effect, all done in camera by using live composite, but in a daytime mode as opposed to uh, in an evening mode. People ask me if it's cold there. Does that answer your question? Um, so the magic, again, for me is the sunrises and the sunsets, but careful to find foreground elements. In this case, of course, it was this bed of water. I did a slow exposure. I think this is a six second exposure with that amazing sky in the background. And then uh, this is the next morning where I'm trying to capture reflections in the water in one of the valleys that uh, we uh, came across. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, panoramas in a location like this are just magical. And uh, it's the only way to kind of give you the full uh, scope of it, but the problem is, is it gives you a narrow image. This is a, a glaciered area and uh, spent a fair amount of time here. And you know, Matt was talking about the image stabilization for video. This is video. I'm hand holding this, turning the camera. And again, had I not told you that, you would have thought that I was maybe on a, um, tripod or something, but that's all handheld. Um, and then I look for those nuggets that are in here. And uh, the skies are magical and the beautiful blues, that's just the way it is. Um, and then I'll try and maybe focus in closer on components of the uh, ice structures that are there. And then as the sun really starts to go down, then I did a 
panorama of this whole area and off to the left of the image is where I was concentrating on a lot of the images that I just shared with you. And Diamond Beach is, uh, the Black Diamond Beach here is an, amer is an amazing, uh, just uh, fabulous to see because again, there's no two days that are the same. In this case, I was trying to capture movement in the water, a little bit slower shutter speed, but yet that iceberg function in the front, I had to be careful because that would move every once in a while and I needed that to be tack sharp. So a lot of it's timing. And then you got to get the Aurora Borealis, of course, while you're there. And when shooting Aurora Borealis, you know, people have asked me, what's the magic time frame on it? And through my uh, years of shooting, that's six to eight seconds, I think, is the magic time frame. Why? Because they move and they dance. And yes, you need some light in this thing here, but if you go much beyond the eight seconds, then it starts to blur. And if you go much under the six seconds, you may not be able to capture all the light. So again, for me, the sweet spot that I found over the years is that six to eight second time frame. And just, you know, again, I don't, I don't know how to describe it except say it's magic. So part of this uh, trip, I wanted to get into the ice cave. So I spent a fair amount of time concentrating on it. This is some video, again, handheld with the image stabilization, just to show you all the amazing textures and components that are in these caves that are just magical. So then I would focus, you know, on just different segments of it. It almost, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, all, they're abstract in many ways, just taking little bits and pieces of these caves. And to touch it, it's as smooth as can be in some areas, and then it can be as rough as some areas. So in order to give you a little bit of depth, I asked a couple of my friends to stand at the opening of this so you could see the size and the mass of the, uh, the caves that are in there, and uh, again, just, just magical. And here, here it is as we're heading out, purposely putting a person in there so you can get an idea of the, uh, the scale of the image of the, of the caves. Yeah, on that one, I probably opened up at about F16 so that I could get the starburst. So I obviously doing that purposely, uh, but there's always trade-offs. You know, again, dealing with the you need that much more light when you're photographing it. So, you know, I look for unique qualities, and do you see the eye in the uh, mount, the ice mountain in the background there? Again, that's what uh, caught my eye, and yet trying to put a foreground element into it along with the reflection that you see there. And when you come across, uh, of course, the reindeer that are there, you've got you to snap a shot of that. So here's another area that I spent some time on. This is another video handheld. I'm uh, just simply turning myself uh, in order to capture everything that you see here. So that is not just a, a pano being moved. That's actually a video that, uh, of the area. And this is one of my favorite images from that spot. And again, as I just said to you earlier about trying to find foreground elements and you know, mid-ground background to create uh, uh, an image, hopefully, uh, of more interest. And when I see those pockets of daylight that come through, I saw the um, sun on the mountain, the opening anyway, where it was coming down. And I thought, well, maybe a little luck. It'll move down towards this structure. And sure enough, it did. But it only stayed there a couple seconds. And so I had to prepare myself in order to, uh, to capture that. And of course, you got to photograph the ponies when you're out there. And even though they're not technically ponies, they call them in Iceland ponies. Um, and um, again, utilizing the using the light to your benefit. To, you know, or you know, if he turned the other way, it would not have worked. <coughs> Here's a structure that I saw from a distance, and I was thinking, well, this is interesting to get these old tires that are frozen in there. But the more I looked at it, I said, no, I need to get up closer to that. And in this case, this is a 60 second exposure uh, where I wanted the movement of the sky and the clouds, yet the sun was peeking through enough to give me that element of interest. And a lot of times I'll look at an image though and say, how can I do this better or what can I do better? And in some cases I'll th say to myself, black and white might work better. And in this particular case, you know, I shot it in black and white. You decide whether you like a better color or black and white, but again, the same location, same time frame. And here's a little, island that's uh, all uh, frozen and once I saw that I knew I had to get down there hoping it would be safe but it was one of the most amazing areas of Iceland because the sky changed and everything and there were all these interesting ice structures that had popped up and broke through and created these interesting uh, uh, art structure elements if you will and uh, I call that my time machine because I felt like if I went through there I'd, you know go into some other dimension uh, here, here it is at a different location, and, and 
the sky that you see is the way it was. It was the, the colors were jumping off the, you know, off the page on this, and it was just absolutely amazing to uh, see this. Um, and again, just some of the waterfalls that are there, it's, it's, it's magical. This is the largest uh, one, and if you ask me to pronounce it, I'll just botch it so I won't endeavor to tell you what it is, but uh, uh, just beautiful beyond belief. So with that, I want to take segments of that, photograph those components, try to catch a rainbow in it where you can. Uh, people ask me when I go, and I typically want to pick the coldest time of the year to photograph these places for a lot of reasons. One is it's the least amount of people because it's so darn cold, and two, because um, I want these conditions to, uh, to photograph in. And this was an area where the water is actually that blue, that's not photoshopped or anything like that, and it's a pretty large area. And this next image, I'm zoomed in a little bit closer, and I said to myself, I need to get down into this, and so hiked around the backside, and here's some images where I just took some of those pieces of ice, put that in the foreground, and you can see the falls in the background. Still being careful that I wanted to include part of the sky in, into, uh, into the image. And here's one where, uh, as we were heading back out, they had just plowed this driveway up to that church, and the driveway creates a leading line, but the sun creates a leading line. And can you see the gold color where it's just hitting the peaks of the trees, hopefully taking you right up to where that church is, and yet still having some interesting dynamics in the sky. So the last place I'm going to share with you is uh, Norway. This is in the Lofoten Islands, uh, one of the most pristine, beautiful areas I've ever seen. And I almost look at this and think this is what Iceland might have been like 30, 40 years ago. And I suspect this will become more popular. And by the way, that is also video uh, handheld with uh, uh, the built-in image stabilization. But the, uh, if you look at the foreground here, that's all underwater. I mean, it's that clear. It's just magical to see the, uh, the purity of a lot of this. Fishing is the main business that supports this part. This is as far north as you can go in Norway. If you go any further, you're, you're in the ocean. So uh, this is as far up as you can get. But there's some magical opportunities along the way. The, the landscapes, the seascapes, uh, these leading lines that take you out to the ocean are just magical. And this is one of my favorite images from this trip. Uh, this is a 60 second exposure uh, where I wanted the, uh, the, the sky and the water to come uh, by blending that together with a long exposure in those beautiful red uh, uh, homes. I'm assuming that's where they are across the way. And if you look at the reflections in the water, you know, it just creates this, for me, a very, uh, very appealing image. And again, the sky's there, they change all the time. This was a hike up to a, where a radio tower was, and this was the last shot I got before the storm just socked us in, and we had a hike back down, but I was able to at least get one snap. But look at the blue in the lower right-hand corner of the water. Just absolutely amazing. And did I mention fishing was their mainstay? Um, it fish everywhere, and I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll get some video of this and walk through underneath here and get a shot of all these fish heads hanging up there. And I will tell you, if you have the opportunity to do this, don't. Or if you do, wear a plastic bag over you. So I got back out from underneath that. I'm like, what the heck is all over me? Well, I don't have to tell you, you know, walking through that. It was uh, probably not the smartest thing I've ever done. So anyway, here's a shot of just the fish heads with the storm and the mountain in the background of what I had just hiked into. Uh, looking for foreground elements, of course, in this case, the frozen ice with those beautiful red uh, homes in the background. This is an early morning, the sun peeked through, and all of a sudden those rays started peaking there. I tried to find a foreground element as quickly as I could, so as soon as I saw it, I didn't think I wanted to photograph the rays. I wanted to be thinking about my composition, so I found that structure, and um, there's a, actually a boat in the foreground of the house with a, uh, uh, the, the light rays shining through. Again, one of those where it just lasts a short period of time. Uh, one of the churches with uh, the frozen water in the foreground. And this next one, you may have seen imagery from this location. It's become somewhat popular. I call this one Escaping the Storm. You'll see the uh, fishing boat on the left side coming back into the main uh, area there. And my intention was to photograph this place um, just as it started to go to night when the lights might come on. 
So uh, I waited and did a long exposure, and you can see this guy in the background getting a little challenging, but the water smoothed out here. And uh, I took another one just a little bit later, moved myself ever so slightly, and you can see the sun peeking through in the back. And I thought, I'm going to get it. Uh, and uh, two minutes later, one of the most horrific storms that I had got hit with. We had snow, sleet, rain, and some other stuff. I didn't know what it was. And of course, I didn't get the opportunity to shoot it with the lights on. But you, you, you make do with what, what you've got. Um, an, an area nearby uh, the next morning, then of course the sky changes on this. And I shoot, you know, any time of the day. I went down, I saw this beautiful seaweed in the foreground, and wanted to get the reflections of the light of the background. This is the one fishing village. The only thing is, I thought there was more stability to that the seaweed, and uh, let's just say uh, I had to be doing some extra drying that evening after I shot this. Here's one where uh, I've gotten a lot of comments on this one. This is um, a, a structure that uh, was surrounded in the back by this amazing storm, <coughs> excuse me, and the lights from those two or three homes that are there. I found the bridge looking for my leading line to hopefully take you into the picture, got it set up, got the shot, and a minute or two later the storm came through and totally changed the, uh, the entire opportunity. But the area is massive. The, it's, it's, I can't even describe it. It's just, it's huge, it's big, it's bold, it's colorful. Um, and one of the things you heard Matt talk about earlier was focus stacking, focus bracketing for uh, uh, mac macro work. But I will also tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it works great for landscape work. And in this particular case, you know, I focused on that shell that you see on top of the seaweed. Everything is tack sharp from that shell all the way back to the mountains and to the clouds to the back. And so focus stacking and focus bracketing work well also in landscapes. So the other thing about Norway, of course, is they have amazing aurora borealis. If you have the opportunity to find something reflective in your foreground, that will add additional interest to your image. In this case, I have a frozen pond that is in front of me, and you can obviously see the reflections from that. So with that being said, I'm going to pack it up as I leave the shark fin uh, behind me. And uh, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Now, one of the things that I got asked Jim and Matt, and you guys for that matter, I have about a dozen shots from the EM5 Mark 10 behind us. If you want me, I can sh run through them quick, or do you, is that a yes? Yes. Are we good, boss? You got it. Okay, I said you got it. So. I'll jump into this real quick and just show you some of the things that I've been shooting with. I've had this camera, like I said, just about a little over four weeks now, and I have been impressed Which beyond. Uh, this, the one you see right here is the 7 to 14. This is the wide angle. I mentioned I'm a wide angle shooter. Well, 10 camera, you said? Huh? EM5 Mark, EM, EM5 Mark III. That's what this camera does. Yeah, everything you see now here, that's everything is shot with that. The new camera. The brand new camera. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. And, you know, again, as I mentioned, uh, I like wide angles, and I do a lot of architectural work. So, you know, for me, this thing has really performed very, very well. This is in Cleveland. Uh, they call this the arcade building. These are all handheld. Everything you're seeing here is handheld. Yeah. And then I even had the opportunity to be in Disney a couple of weeks ago, and I had to get the Millennial Falcon uh, with the new exhibit there. And I cut the bottom off just where all the people's heads are. So if you look closely at this image, there isn't one person in this image at Disney, which is a rarity in of itself. But uh, again, we as photographers, we get to decide what we want in and what we don't want in. And uh, happened to walk by uh, in Epcot, and Billy Ocean, for those of you who may know him, was performing live. And I thought, well, let's give this thing a test in some dark conditions. And uh, it. Should speed? Uh, I'm, I'm probably a sixtieth to an eightieth of a second. Yeah, because. Because I had, there's movement, so I don't want to compromise it. Yeah, absolutely. And again, he's tack sharp. Uh, if we could zoom in on it, you could see it's just pretty amazing. Nice scene, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and this is actually focus stacked uh, in camera. Um, I wanted uh, Mickey in the foreground to be sharp, and I saw certainly wanted the castle in there. And it's fast enough because it was a bright part of the day where I was able to um, make all that work. Um, the haunted castle, you know, that. Uh, so I had to kill some time while I was standing in line. And again, here's one at, uh, I, I, it's either 5,000 or 6,400 ISO. Uh, again, wanting to see what, how this thing can perform. 
and I've pixel peeked on this thing, and I got to tell you, speed here. Uh, it's probably around the same thing, 60th or an 80th of a second, yeah. Or maybe it might even be a little, yeah. Everything's handheld. Yeah. And then our final days of fall, I wanted to capture a few images. Uh, uh, this is a location called the Lehigh Parkway, and test its dynamic range, see how it would perform. And I brought my trusty companion with me when I go down there and photograph, and he was kind enough to pose for me. Uh, and again, those few final moments of color. Here's one that's, uh, I don't remember, maybe a quarter to a half second, just testing its uh, image stabilization. You can see the softness in the water. And uh, here's my wife and the pooch uh, finishing out a hike that we did and just a little over a week or so ago I was in Bradenton and uh, Florida doing uh, some bird work there uh, with uh, the group uh, down there and just uh, uh, totally impressed with uh, the camera. This is the 12 100 if you wanted to know the lens that I'm using and uh, it's tack sharp beyond my expectation. Here's an egret and a um, stork, which I'm told is a rarity because they typically don't, they're not compatible with each other. So uh, anyway, I got a shot of them. Here's what the 300 millimeter I put on the EM5 Mark III of the Osprey. And uh, you can count the, the feathers on this guy. It is just unbelievable. Again, everything handheld. And we talked about, uh, you know, its ability to track. Uh, and boy, I tell you, I was absolutely impressed with the the result from this this camera. Um, great dynamic range, just the, the colors and everything about it, and of course even for, you know, uh, local landscapes. So, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, now I'll say thank you again, and if we have time, I'm glad to answer some questions. Guys, do we have time for some questions? Uh, I think that's up to okay, it's four o'clock, so, uh, yes sir. How do I adjust the saturation for different medias? Is that basically your question? I think that might be it. I mean, when you look, came today, could you anticipate that these particular screens would give you the full range? No, I can never anticipate what kind of screens I'm going to have to work with. So what I do is what is right to my eye and on my screen. That's how I do it. And if it shows up differently, then it, it, is, it falls where it falls. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So the question is, what is my impression of the new camera to the EM1 Mark II or the EM5 Mark II? It's miles above it. The sensor, the image stabilization, uh, I mean, it, the EM5 Mark II is, is a great camera, but the technology advancements that they've got in this thing is pretty much what you see in the EM1 Mark II, and uh, it's, it's, it's a power horse. Absolutely. Is it the question is the ease of use comparatively? It's very similar. The menu system is very similar. There's a few different nuances, uh, but for the most part, it took me uh, you know 30 seconds to adapt to it, and I was ready to go. Any other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, you have been a delight. Thank you, B and H. Thank you, Olympus, and thank you guys in the room and also on the line. Thank you so much.